How you feeling today? You good? Yeah, yeah bro. Yeah. Yeah. It's my first time here. You got a single here. It's a, it's a vibe. So, yeah. Oh, it's a big fucking deal. Yeah, it should be, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can feel it. What's up, everybody? It is Jinx from Complex News. We are on day two of the second year of Complex Con out here in Long Beach, California. As you guys can see, we're sitting here with two very special guests. Kobe Bryant, Kendrick Lamar, how you guys doing today? How you doing? Fantastic. Man. I'm doing all right, man. It's day two, so I'm holding up. Mm -hmm. You guys are just getting here. You guys ready to hit the floor and see what's going on out Come there? Come on, man. It's my guy, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, right. <laughs> all right, you guys can do it together. You guys are both icons, right, in your respective fields. We're here to take today to talk about the evolution of that process of arriving. We look at you, Kobe, eight to 24 is the two different chapters, the way you came into the league, the way you finished your time in the NBA. Can you find distinct moments where you felt like, can you find a distinction between number eight and number 24 for yourself? Uh, it's, it's crystal clear to me because it's two different, it's almost two different people in a sense. You know, of having a certain mentality of coming in the league where you know, you're literally head hunting everyone, right? Because it's your time to establish yourself and say, no, I belong here, right? And so this, you know, as a result, everybody must go, yeah. right? And then when you hit a certain maturity level, which is where 24, it becomes less about your self-domination, it becomes how can I help others grow? And how can I lead a group of guys to get to a certain level as a group? And that's a really big distinction. Looking back on number eight, what would 24 say to number eight in those like early years? Um, I think with 24 and his um, really old grandfatherly wisdom would say just keep head hunting because that's how Dude. I got to be number 24 in the first place. Word, word, <laughs> word. Kendrick, for you. K. Dot into, I guess, what we want to call now Kenny, Kung Fu Kenny. Mm. You're at a point now where people, the respect is there. Can you find a distinction point between those two personas or are they different? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, it's definitely a big difference. Um, same what Kobe just said, K. Dot, this is me prepping myself as far as the lyrical ability and being able to go in the studio and say, you know what, I want to be the best wordsmith. Anybody that gets on this track, I have to just, you know, annihilate, you know, however that is, whether it's through rhyme schemes, whether it's through metaphors, whether it's just punchlines, whether it's just wordplay. And um, I didn't have the, the actual technique of songwriting then. And this where, you know, this is, this is, this is the transition where Kendrick Lamar, Kung Fu Kenny, I, I look at Kung Fu Kenny as a, uh, a master of the craft now. Now you have the ability to make songs and, still have the, 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 you know, the wordsmith technique and intertwine it and have a composed mentality on how to approach music. Now you're just not connecting with people in the studio or your homies, you're connecting with people around the world universally. Is it a desire to be great something that you walk in the game with or is it something that you kind of, you start to earn as you start to see your skills develop? You start feeling like, I got this, like I got something I can, I can do. Or do you set out the moment you first pick up the rock, get in the studio and say, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be the best. Uh, I mean, I, for me, I set out immediately to be the best. I mean, it was a decision, right? And you can't, you know, at what point do you say, okay, I have the skills that are good enough to be one of the best ever? Mm -hmm. you, how do you even know that, right? I think it has to be a, a quest from day one. This is a choice that you're gonna make. And you know the sacrifices that come along with that. But once you make that deal with yourself, that's it, there's no going back. It's a process and it's kind of gradual, but was there ever like a game or a point in practice any point, personal, where you were like, oh, I'm here, this is? Um, there was a practice, I was 18, and we were scrimmaging. And so it was myself, Derek Fisher at the time. If you don't remember Travis Knight, Travis Knight was, mm -hmm. you know, one of, and it was our second unit going against the first unit. So that was Nick Van Exel, Eddie Jones, Shaquille O'Neal, yeah. Eldon mm -hmm. Campbell. And so on my second unit team was a player named Corey Blunt. Mm -hmm. And so the score was tied, the game goes to seven, six, six. Right, I get doubled, I pass the ball to Corey Blunt, Corey Blunt takes the shot from the corner, misses it, ball bounces long, Nick goes down, lays it up, first team wins. And so I start flipping tables, throwing chairs. Yeah. I mean, I let Corey have it. And Corey's <laughs> like, hey man, it's just a game. I'm like, man, it's not a game. And I went back in the locker room and I was like, man, I might be, I might be cut a little different. Maybe this is just a game, but I can't get over it. It's not, right. Why can't I get over this thing? Like, they left, went home. I'm still thinking about it the next day. Yeah. Like, all right, well, maybe, maybe I'm a little different. So that's not so much as I, I've arrived here, but it's more like I care about this a little mm -hmm. bit more than mm -hmm. everybody else. And in that sense, I arrived. Yeah. Dope. Um, mine's probably a little bit <laughs> different than that. <laughs> uh, mine's come from a, a standpoint where 
you know, after so long of spitting raps to your homies and, and your friends and in the neighborhood and being in the studio, um, you kind of feel that, you know, this is all you know and this is your audience, especially being in Compton, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a small city. And I think the moment um, I was able to go overseas, and I think it was a show in London, and I'm, I'm doing my raps or whatever, um, and I see the people in the front row reciting these lyrics as if they wrote them inside my, you know, mom's kitchen where I was at writing them. Yeah. And uh, this right here took my whole uh, approach and, and appreciation, appreciation for music on a whole nother level because now I see that, you know, these words just not for, you know, me and my friends. You know, it's people that actually connect with them um, that I've never met. And that's the moment I felt, you know, I've arrived. This, this is not just, uh, it's not just something I do for fun. You know, I'm always doing it for fun, but now I see that other people enjoy it the same way we enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that gave me another fuel and battery in my back to keep doing it. In rap, you know, even as a competitive sport, a lot of guys are calling themselves great. Mm -hmm. You're at a point where you can call yourself the best rapper alive, and you have, and it's fact, mm -hmm. right? Like, you can mean it. What do people misconstrued about greatness? What's the missing puzzle piece, right? Because it's like, of course there's hard work, right? Of course you have to have the mindset. Mm -hmm. What's the missing puzzle piece in greatness? that you can't just say it? Uh, well, I, I think there's a certain uh, stubbornness that comes along with mm -hmm. being great. I think people see greatness as kind of an easy road, right? It's like yeah. a one path thing. You work hard <laughs> and then all of yeah. a sudden it happens. It don't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot of darkness that comes from that as well. I mean, there's a lot of experiences, personal experiences that you go through that you use as fuel to propel you forward, whereas otherwise it would just be obstacles for others. It might even prevent them from going forward Right, whereas for us, I mean, those moments do, do nothing but fuel us even more. Exactly. So there's a lot of, you know, the, the anxiety, right, the fear, the anger, all of that stuff plays a significant part in it, just as much as love does. And uh, it's not it's not easy. But if it was easy, I guess everyone, you know, you have a world filled of lions, but right, yeah, lions need gazelles. So. Exactly. It's it's the curiosity <laughs> of that, you know, the, what he's saying, the, the fear, the anxiety. It's the curiosity of knowing damn, I can possibly overcome this, you know, and, and when you do, and another one approaches, like, I want to, I want to challenge that too, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's real greatness, to almost be, you know, you, we spend so much time prepping, you know, our, our careers and what's next and, you know, how we go, you know, move through it, but at the same time, it's always that curiosity in the back of our heads, like, what's to come and how can I conquer that? That's, that's, for me, I know for, you know, Kobe as well, that's a thing for us, and it always drives us. What inspires you now? Is it the same things from before? And if so, what are they, or is it something different? Mm. Uh, yeah, definitely the same things. Um, I think it just magnified now. Um, I always go back to, you know, how I will feel, you know, once I've reached these amount of records or touched this amount of people and being on these certain stages. Now for me, it's, it's really just keeping that compassion for that and always remembering that and that, that hunger and that, that challenge. Not you know, some, Yeah, exactly. And sometimes even going back to smaller venues, you know, you're doing these arenas all day, every day. When you go back to these small hole in the walls, same way we did with Tupac Butterfly, we did 11 dates, 500 people in the building. You know what I'm saying? That inspires me because these are the same people that's been with me for day one. Yeah. And I can look them dead in their eyes and, and, and say, you know, we're going to continue to carry this thing we call great music forever. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the inspiration behind that. And seeing them out there and rocking, and, you know, they can actually hang on a banister. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you can't do that in stadium. You can't do that. You can't feel that energy. You know, so being out there and to feel that, that's, that's, you know, that's still giving me that same drive and that same hunger. Yeah, you know. you're at a different point in your career now. Um, you're no longer on the court. Yeah. What's your inspiration now? Fast forward 20 years from now, if basketball is the best thing that I've done in my life, then I've failed. Hmm. It's a very simple, very simple mission, very simple quest, a very simple goal. You know, these next 20 years need to be better than the previous 20. Wow. Right? And it's as simple as that. And that, that's what drives me. That's heavy. Yeah. Basketball and hip-hop, right? It's like they're married. Is there someone on the court that he reminds you of? Yeah, it was me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can't ask that. It was, it you better not me. ask me that question. I'm not, I know the answer. Yeah, I mean, yeah. No, listen, it's the same, it's the yeah. same hunger. Look, like, step out there on the court, taking heads off. It's not, it's not, there's no, I don't want to hear it. 
Like, I don't want to hear Michael's the best player in the world. I want to hear they call him Black Jesus. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> you have to show me. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So, that's yeah. that. <laughs> all right. All right. Let me just skip that. Right, you just like erase yeah. the next three. All right. You were in the building for his final game. What was that like? I mean, like LA, right? Like, you've watched the entirety of his career. Uh-huh. A lot of ways, he's defined LA and the world you grew up in, showing you possibilities, and he's not that far from you. Right. But then, especially when you see the final game, he's actually fit, like not that far from you. Yeah. What was that? You know, it's funny. We didn't actually know what was happening until like the final moments. Because, I mean, you, you're in it. And we watching him. I mean, it's like, he's, okay, 34 points, okay. 40 points. Okay, this is, this is a, this is a Kobe night on this last <laughs> night. You know what I'm saying? But it's a, it's, a, it's a switch that's starting to happen. Now it's like a damn near glitch. And me and Schoolboy Q looking at each other like, is this really happening? You know, everybody's just, you know, appalled, but we're looking like, damn, he's really about to do this on this final game. That is, that's, that's a different type of fucking greatness, man. <laughs> like, you, 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 that's like. Storybook. Yeah, I mean, it's not even just a story, but it's just like the hunger, you know, to be able to say, I'm still finna go out here and give my motherfucking blood, sweat, and tears on this court, like, you know, most people be like, farewell. Nah, oh, like we, me and Q is like, yo, this, this, this is the type of stuff we gotta apply to not only in music, but our day-to-day lives. You know, this man went out there and gave his all for years and is still, you know, on his last game, put that energy and that effort out there. This, this is just a, a you know, a life lesson, you know, for everybody that was in that building. That's how we was feeling. Right. I don't remember sitting next to Q saying yeah. the exact same thing. Appreciate that, man. Yeah. That final walkout, what was it? When I showed up at Staples Center, it felt like the, the building felt almost somber. I said, why is everybody so damn down? Like, I, this should be a celebration. Yeah. I just played 20 years, and I, my goal was to give the city something to remember. Let's give them something to talk about, something to leave here and be excited about. And then the game started, and I missed, like, my first eight shots. Oh, and I was yeah. like, okay, well, this is either going to be the worst exit game ever or it's going to be the best one. And so I'm comfortable either or. So, you know, I'm going to just keep on going. <laughs> you keep on going. And then what happens is the game starts rolling, then you start thinking tactically. That's when things get going mm-hmm. because the crowd disappears and all you see is the schematics of things. Right? You start processing movements and you start processing hmm. how to pick things apart and everything else vanishes. And then the game, the buzzer sounds and you're like, whoa. Wow. Whoa, this just happened. That's crazy. <laughs> this yeah, just that's happened. how we felt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that shit just happened. <laughs> yeah. That's it's crazy. Cool. Both Nike boys, you have a signature line. You wore tons of other models on the court. Hirachis, 2 k 4 2 k 5 Zoom Flights. Yep. I've seen you exploring. You got Air Forces on, right? You're doing the 97s. You're doing the Cortezes. Mm-hmm. Could you ever see yourself having your own signature line? Oh, yeah, definitely. What advice would you give to him for a signature line? Make it your own. Mm-hmm. Right, and I mean that. I mean it's it's like it, it has to come from within. It's your story. So like, if you take all of my signature sneakers, they're just snapshots of where I was at a moment in time in my life. Mm. And the reason why they're designed a certain way is because it's a snapshot of a particular journey in my life, emotionally that I'm going through, where my game is going. So when the designs come from inside, mm. then they truly become signature because you can't take that shoe and apply that to anyone else in the world because it's your own story. Right. Exactly. That's the magic. That's real talk. Finally, you guys are two very different places. Kobe, you're embarking on a new journey. I want to know what challenge you think, what's the biggest challenge you think you have ahead of you? And you're in the eye of the storm right now. Mm. You're, you're in the game still, right? Mm. And you're scoring at a very high level. What's the big, I think sometimes people can look at you and think, well, he's good, right? Like, he's up there. But the, those are new challenges. Mm. What's the biggest challenge ahead of you? Um, more time in a day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> to do more. Yeah. Um, and, at the, at the level I'm at, you know, um, on a on a music level, it's opened up so many different avenues uh, as far as business. Um, but I always want to keep the music first. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And this, and this is a, this is a, a challenge that I'm seeing that's happening right right now today. Keeping the music 100% first, but not being stagnant in you know other ideas and, and other create you know creatives that I have to offer in the world. My challenge is is, is um, letting go of what was, mm. focus on building what's to come, and that's very very hard because you know, twenty years of career, legacy, 
Kobe Bryant, things of that nature, the easy thing would be to build upon that still, right? The hard thing to do is to let that go, right? And now focus on building a studio, focus on building a content company from books to, to, to films and everything in between. Yeah. Focus on what's ahead, right? And it takes a lot of bravery to be able to do that because what if that falls flat, then what, mm -hmm. right? It's always easier to go with what is. That's what you know. Right, but that ain't what we do. Right. right, we push, we push forward, and that's the that's the biggest challenge ahead. And uh, we can make these next twenty years greater than the previous twenty. I'll be happy. Yeah. Icons, fellas, thank you. I thank you. appreciate, appreciate it, man.